Howdy listeners, as we all know, planet Earth has 7.5 billion people and 7.4 billion of those people have small businesses. Now to be fair, numbers that size can be hard to envision and to be even fairer, most of what I just said is entirely made up. But I'll tell you what isn't made up, keep. Keep is the all-in-one client management software designed specifically for small businesses. Keep takes the most annoying and laborious parts of running a small business and metaphorically tosses them into the sun. Stop grinding yourself to death with busy work and repetitive tasks. Let Keep integrate your customer follow-ups, messaging automation, next-level appointment setting, and so much more. Head over to Keep.com and start your free trial of Keep Grow, Keep Pro, or for those looking for something beefier, talk to one of our coaches about Infusionsoft, the product that started it all. More business, less work, that's Keep. Just go to Keep.com to start your free trial. That's K-E-A-P.com. One more time, that's K-E-A-P.com. <laughs> Do you see my roommate just said, don't record yet. I, I have to flush the toilet. I heard that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. That's like... Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yeah, they heard, Morgan. So go ahead and flush away and then stay in your room. Exactly. I saw that, Jennifer. Okay, Charlie, that's go the see your Disneyland aunt. <clears throat> the coronavirus, the coronavirus equivalent like of that. the... That's my favorite part of the newscast ones. I like... I chuckle so hard watching the newscast ones because it's like, why do they try to act like nothing's happening? If Morgan flushed the toilet in the middle of the recording, I would just say, Morgan, you just made an appearance on the podcast. Like, I wouldn't try to pretend like it didn't happen. I think it's so extreme. Okay, so that being said, are we ready to dive in here? Because I think Grace is going to start thinking we just invited her so that we can chat and make (laughs) new friends. (laughs) Which is only half true. (laughs) We have. This podcast is simply a way for us to connect at this point. Uh, Oh, man. Okay, so I wanted to talk about what are our quarantine weekend plans. So, Scott, do you have any quarantine weekend plans? I might be really boring on this. And I asked my wife out on a date tonight, and I was like, we could go to your office, um, which is just a bedroom in our house. We could go upstairs. There's not going to be much happening when you're in quarantine. So I think for us, it's probably, we're going to probably find a new series to binge watch. We're going to probably keep doing our exercise, family exercise routines. We've been alternating yoga one day. And then we did like my son, my son has like a, you know, build muscle mass version the next day. So I don't know what we're going to (laughs) do. Maybe we'll go into meditation over the weekend. Maybe. I don't know. Well, that would be good. Meditation, date night. I'm literally painting my entire downstairs to avoid yellow bouncing light. So that is my quarantine plan. I may have a quarantini, which is basically a martini at home. Um, but that's the kind of level of excitement I'm having. So we have our guest here, Grace Abruzzo. Did I say that right, Grace? Yes. So I'm dying to know what are your quarantine weekend plans for this coming weekend? Actually, I am creating an online course right now. So that's <laughs> <laughs> that's my weekend plan <laughs> is to finish it. You and you have such the entrepreneur answer here. I mean, that, <laughs> that right, Scott? If that that's is, not an entrepreneur answer, I don't know what is. Okay. Crystal's curling up with the quarantini. You're curling up with an online course. I love it. Yeah. I love it too. Nothing like serving your audience. You know, they need help any day of the week, right? Mm-hmm. So, Grace, I guess we can dive right in here and talk about you. I'm so curious by looking at anything Derek sent us about what you do. So can you share a little bit your business name and what you do for your job and where kind of your passion came from for what you do? Yes. So um, my business is called Rooted Physical Therapy. And I am a physical therapist specializing in the pelvis. So specifically, I typically tend to work with women, but I can work with any sexual, any gender, any transitioning, any age. Um, How I got into this? Well, I got into it because I have a history of needing what I now provide from a young child. And then when I was in physical therapy school and I learned that this was the thing that I always needed that I never knew existed and that most people don't know it exists and even now people don't understand what it is that I do. 
um, I was immediately hooked. And, and since then it's, it's been, um, really, it's just aligning my passions and my calling and using it to provide a service. Definitely. So I, I, we were chatting a bit before Scott hopped on here and I was telling you that I inherited my dad's bad hips Right. and it really like, it, it bothers me every day. Now I used to th- kind of, you know, kids are mean. I realize now I used to laugh at my dad when he would struggle to even sit like crisscross applesauce mm-hmm. and the struggle is real now. I mean, it is hard for me. I was telling you, I can do a squat, but I can't get as low as I know I could for the amount of weight I can squat with, but I can't get any lower because my hips hurt. So I was saying, I know I need some PT and it sounds like, I don't know if that's a general area, but could you elaborate a bit more on like the pelvic area and why women maybe need some special attention for PT? Yes. I have two thoughts coming. So I'll answer your question and then I'm going to feed back another question. Um, Great. So a lot of people, when I say I'm a pelvic specialist, it your mind goes to thinking that I only treat the pelvis, but I actually am educated in treating the whole body and I specialize in the pelvis. So even though it's just like uh, thinking, okay, what does that really mean? To me, it means that I am curious and skilled in treating the deepest parts of ourselves. So the subjects that you really don't want to share with a medical provider, the conversations that you hardly can have with your spouse. um, Those are the things I'm, I'm typically working on with people. And I believe that it's that foundation deep within us that can be the contributing factor in other body pains that you might be experiencing. So there's more details around what that actually looks like, but that's kind of the general concept. I would imagine people don't necessarily think that when they think physical therapist, right? No. <laughs> so what's that, how, how does that experience unfold where you go from a pelvic specialist to you know, treating in this, in this maybe more holistic way? Yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of the, the difficulty in um, creating a, a clientele is in the education piece because it's not like you, you know, your back hurts, go see a chiropractor. Like everyone knows how to finish that sentence versus like, I have pain when I have sex or I leak my pants every time I sneeze, that kind of thing. People are like, well, (laughs) so, (laughs) so yeah, it's, um, uh, there's a huge education piece on just the general idea of what it is that I do and transitioning like the buy-in on how to convince who I'm working with that like, actually this is the deeper problem that we really need to work on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just, it takes a lot of practice on my end. I think too, like women are taught from a young age or have been for a long time. I think it's starting to shift, but it's a slow shift Mm -hmm. that some of these things you shouldn't talk about, you know, like it's it's supposed to kind of keep quiet about it. It's like, don't mention that. But you know, a lot of times probably with some PT or with some other help, they could probably be helped. I mean, the thing I always had friends, you know, that have already had kids that tell me, you know, the sneezing and coughing and then peeing thing is like a natural thing. But the older I get, I'm like, I don't know, there's been a couple coughs that I have not had kids, but I feel like it's a very close to peeing my pants kind of situation. I am so excited to have this conversation. Every time I have it, I get just light up on the inside. So I have so much to say to you right now. Um, one is I need help, right? Just right. Kidding. So it, it's, it's a very like there's intersectional experiences of this this being what you're talking about, shame around women sharing their intimate experiences with their pelvis. But it's, it's also applicable to men. It has more to do with the masculine rather than men. So men also experience this. So I, I also have male clients who come in with anal pain, difficulty having a bowel movement, um, testicular pain, and um, penile dysfunction, prostate issues. So it's also the shame experience is, yeah. is shared across the board. And it, it's because we're operating from a system that um, there's only one normal and everyone else is othered. 
right? So the work I'm doing is actually coming under that in trying to um, validate, inform, hold compassion for the experiences and the stories that are behind all that pain, and then reframe all of it. So it, it seems very like I'm working on one person at a time, but the change I'm making, I'm hoping that we're all going to experience it. Because if you do healing, yeah. your partner is going to feel it. Your kids are going to feel it. Your friends are going to feel it. It's going to change the world. <laughs> For sure. I mean, if your body's not working the way you need it to, to feel healthy and feel good, I mean, that changes every aspect of your life. Mm-hmm. So I think it's so cool that you, I know Scott talks a lot about identifying a problem and a passion that you have to fix that problem and then creating a business about that. And it's clear you've done that. Um, for other small businesses out there that are in fields that are sometimes hard to talk about or hard to explain what you do, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, people respond best when they hear it, not just from you, but also from a friend. I would say gathering reviews from people that you've worked with is one of the best ways you can market more than like so many other things. I love that. Just reviews word of are mouth. So critical. Yeah. yeah. So your your first goal is to just make that connection with your first client and have that be a really good experience. And then encourage some feedback that you can share. A lot of people don't really want to share with their friends that they were having pain with sex and that they saw someone for it. So that can be tricky. But maybe even getting um, like a couple sentences from them that you can post on your page, something mm-hmm. like that. So interesting because a lot of business, I mean, we've, we've preached for a long time that education can be a critical part of a really, you know, um, effective and impactful way in marketing. Mm -hmm. Some people are on the opposite end of the spectrum in the sense that they have, they're in a fairly commoditized industry. And so, you know, coming up with unique content is not as natural or easy, shall we say. Mm-hmm. I think you sit maybe on the on the opposite end, which is you you know there, there's a you're in an extremely unique niche, right? And then you add that layer. I think maybe one of the challenges for you, as you're pointing out, you had that layer of, well, I don't really want like it, it's kind of a it's a topic that I don't necessarily want broadcasted in the way that I consume the content, and you know, right. and to your point, you know, somebody who's giving you a positive review. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, what an amazing opportunity you have to be uh, just to to be in this space of education where you're entering a conversation that is going on in people's head, which is usually the goal of that education, but you're, you're entering the conversation that in many cases they have to have alone, you know, like it's just, (laughs) you don't, you don't have maybe with the exception of some very, very close intimate friends, it's a, it's, it's a struggle that they're having to deal with on their own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just imagine that the work you're doing is a breath of fresh air for them to realize for sure, you know, like, and I'm thinking as you're talking about reviews that, even just hearing that somebody else has had a similar issue with you that, you know, like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not like, there's not something wrong with me. I'm just mm-hmm. part of a group of people that need to focus on this. Right. So. Right. Yeah. It can be a very isolating experience to have these types of pains and just chronic pain and visible pain in general. Definitely. I think it's like so interesting what you do. And I think it's really important. I love that your website and everything about you here today, you're just very clear about who you're serving and who you welcome to serve. Um, In a world where I feel like healthcare in some ways has gotten so impersonal, you can tell by your webpage and just hearing you talk today that you keep it very personal. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like certain, um, certain transgender, you know, is becoming more and more common. People are becoming more and more accepting of that. But I feel like we're just starting to tap, like scratch the surface of the things that they might experience and some of the things they're probably embarrassed to speak about too. So I love the fact that you're so open and welcoming to anyone who has an issue um, that you can probably solve. So I love that. Um, That being said, what would you say the advantages of being in like a niche specialty audience serving kind of business? The advantages. Oh, well, I think, um, Scott, even you kind of touched on this. It's easy to get, when you're creating a business, it's easy to get trapped in the idea that there is scarcity. So like there's not enough clients and there's so many, there's so much competition that, you can't 
like they have a lot of people, so there's not enough people for you to have. And there's an orthopedic clinic on every block, so there must not be enough clients or like kind of the idea that you're having to compete to get success, to get success or how you measure success. And, um, I think being in a niche, sometimes I would actually, the reason I actually decided to go into this is because I wanted to be one of the few people diving headfirst into this. I started in my own practice four years ago, and that was when I was only a year out of school. And other colleagues were like, you hardly know anything. Why are you starting your own business? And I was like, there's something that's giving me the confidence that I that's can great. I can level up to what's being provided because I can count on my hand how many people are doing this. I've now come to discover that the feeling of scarcity is more internal than it is external. Um, so the advantages, I think it's maybe an illusion on some end that there is a limited number of clients in the pot and we all need to scramble to get them. There are so many, there's so many people. <laughs> there are so many people yeah. with a lot of money who need this. And many of them are not, it's just, <laughs> it's just not being solved. There is and it's no, not being solved. There is so, no pot. Right. So exactly. So 100%. the thing that I thought was the advantage, I've now learned that that was just me needing to face my internal scarcity ideas. So Grace, so, take us, take us back. I want to, I want to have you go back to the, maybe the, the time when you felt the most self doubt about this move that you made off on your own. And, you know, you, you mentioned some of the feedback you're getting from some of your friends, like, Hey, well, you're not, you're clearly not ready for this. So right. I imagine that was a personal journey for you as well. So take us back. What was the hardest moment and what was it that got you from that place to where you are today? Oh, I so deeply believe in myself. I don't need external validation. I've gotten to a place where if I don't offer this, then I'm holding my, I'm holding myself back in a way and I'm, I'm not living my authentic self and my authentic self is expressing through these gifts. So why would I, why would I quelch that? So there, there have been times and my closest friends know, cause I would call them in distress saying, I give up. <laughs> I'm like, this is too hard. So I had a, a co-partnership for the first year and we dissolved that. And I was like, I'm going through a business divorce. Yeah. <laughs> like we have to sign papers and, and it was so hard. And then I was like, well, should I do this again? And yes. And then recently I rebranded and it's always, there's always something that's going to come in your life, no matter what it is that you're doing. And you might stop and think, can I really do that? <laughs> and you have to have that little voice inside of you who loves you unconditionally and saying all these conditions that you're seeing out here, they don't matter. The unconditional, yeah, you can. You can do anything. And I always come back to that voice. That's awesome. I think you just really are confirming that it's a calling. You feel like you have a purpose and a mission and all of that's aligned to what you do daily. So I think you're going to be clearly a success now and for a long time. Yeah. Based on that alone. And I do think there's people out there that need a lot of help, you know, um, and need more importantly than anything. What I really want when I go to the doctor is feeling like they care about me outside of a textbook. You know, I want to know what they've read in the book. They're not just throwing at me and putting the, you know, which of course that's how they that's how they work. But I want to know they're actually listening to me, hearing what my problems are, hearing what I'm telling them. And so I feel like if you're doing that every day, that's like a gift to have in the healthcare industry these days. So I think it's really cool. Thank you. In any industry, we literally, we all want to be seen and heard by our partners, yeah. by our friends, by everyone. So, and unfortunately the healthcare model does not support doctors in the resources they would need to really successfully do that. That's for sure. Yeah. But I think having your own business does. So that's really cool. You, Which is why you're I able do to this. Build what, I <laughs> yeah. know. That's so awesome. Yeah. You can build exactly what you want out of yes. your own practice. Yeah. So that's really cool. 
Okay. Well, that being said, I think it's a great time for us to break and throw to our worst business ideas in history, where Derek and Ducey will talk about follies from big corporations and how they've messed up. So let's go to that and we'll be right back with more. Howdy, folks. I'm Derek Haru. And I'm Ducey Van Dusen. And this is Worst Business Ideas in History, the show where we look back at some of the most brutal missteps, failures, and flops in consumer history. And make fun of it. But also learn something. Nope. It says in my contract, I don't have to learn. Uh, fi- fine. Uh, the rest of us will learn something, and you can just mock people's misfortune. Sounds good. <sighs> Welcome to the Worst Business Ideas in History. Hi, guys. This is Worst Business Ideas in History. I'm Derek Haru. And I'm Ducey Van Dusen. And today we're going to be talking about Heinz Easy Squirt Ketchup. Okay. Now, Ducey, you have you have more and older children yeah. than I do. Did you guys ever have the Heinz Easy Squirt in your house? Maybe I'm... Maybe I'm... Uh, you'll, you'll have to describe to me exactly what this is, because I was assuming that this is a bottle... Like the upside down bottles that are still around. You know, that's crazy. That is the exact same thought that I had when I saw the the name because it's easy. It's Heinz Easy Squirt Ketchup. So what you think is that the 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 product's pull is that it's easier to use. Hence those bottles that we have now that like they're basically upside down all the time. Yeah. And they're they're like all engineered to be able to get it all out. Like they've put a lot of thought into these bottles. Yeah. I remember those bottles when they came out in the big the big selling point was there's no of that weird ketchup goop at the cap that accumulates. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but what we're talking about today is you might remember this more by sight than by name, and that is Heinz putting out a line of ketchup that came in different colors. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're yes, ringing a bell now. I, I do remember um, like purple ketchup and stuff like that, yeah. And that's usually the one people remember. So apparently um, Heinz put out this, this product in 2000. And um, it came in uh, teal, green, and then uh, primarily it was it was purple that was the most popular. The exception to that being they uh, they put out a green version as a tie-in with the movie Shrek, which uh, I you know. Oh, uh, okay. Which, despite your feelings on Shrek, it's a very <laughs> it's a very successful franchise, and I don't yeah. mean Ducey's feelings. I mean I mean the public at large. Yeah, yeah. It's you know uh, that that, so, that first movie was charming. That, that first was, one. Yeah, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. I didn't need. I didn't need to go deep into the Shrek mythos. Right. But that's a that's a discussion for a different day. So Heinz, this is a pretty straightforward uh, play by Heinz. You know, they're like, you know what kids like? Kids like colors, and kids like ketchup, and kids eat a lot of ketchup. They put ketchup on everything. So let's make it so that kids want to buy our ketchup more. So we'll put it out in these fun colors and these like easy to hold bottles so that the kids feel more involved with, with, you know, meal time. <laughs> I like, I like that phrasing. They're more involved with meal time because I mean, that's a battle sometimes as a parent having kids be involved in meal time. <laughs> Yeah, well, just getting them to, like I, I only have a toddler, so I don't know what happens when they get older. But I know just like my focus is just to get my child, which you can probably hear right now, to stand to remain in a single spot long enough to put food in their mouth. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so they put out these multicolored ketchups, and I, you know, it's it's not a terrible idea. Kids like bright colors, so they made uh, six hundred and fifty million. Ooh. bottles of this stuff wow yeah that was the total uh production load and they sell about that many total bottles of heinz does sells that many total bottles of ketchup almost every single year okay so they mass produced this stuff thinking it was just going to become one of their staple products and as anybody knows heinz is actually a pretty fun company to look at the variety of their products because they make everything like they sell like a bunch of products here in america but worldwide they make all kinds of weird stuff they make pineapple chutney they make uh canned sardines depending on what part of the world you're in um heinz makes a lot of stuff okay yeah that's definitely i mean we kind of think of condiments yeah that's their that's their bread and butter so to speak um (laughs) uh that wasn't intentional it just was already coming out of my mouth and i had to save it (laughs) 
So the problem was that like they actually, you know, there wasn't a problem at first. The truth is the product actually did pretty good. And, you know, they they had some success at the beginning. They sold like 20 million bottles their first uh, quarter, which I guess is good for them. And, uh, you know, kids seem to like it. But after a while, it wore off really fast for a handful of reasons. The first reason was parents buy the ketchup. Kids don't buy the ketchup. Right. When kids go to the store, they're if, if they are coming along on a grocery shopping trip, they care about picking out cereal, asking for sweet snacks, you know, sugary snacks, and the staples are mostly left to the parents, which means the parents are like, I'm not putting purple ketchup on my food. Like, we still need ketchup in the house, and I have no interest in it being you, purple. You may want this, but I don't want this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like cereal... It feels like a thing that it's like, here's some of the kids' cereal and here's the cereal that I eat, but who wants a bunch of different kinds of ketchup bottles all in their fridge, right? Yeah, that was that was the other thing, is that kids have a propensity to collect things. <laughs> and so maybe they buy the purple, the purple bottle of ketchup. Well, the problem is they don't stop at the purple bottle. They want the other colors too, because what's the point of having one color of ketchup if they can't mix it with other colors, which is apparently what a lot of kids want to do. Well, what happens when you mix purple ketchup with green ketchup is you get brown ketchup. Yeah, yeah. And nobody wants to eat brown ketchup. <laughs> the other problem was is that in order to make ketchup green or purple or teal or any of the other colors that they made, they actually had to modify, genetically modify, the ketchup, and I assume the tomatoes they were producing to accept the color because otherwise if you add food coloring to something that's already red red is a really dominant color and so if you add another color to it most of the time again you end up with brown so they modified the ketchup and it apparently changed the texture to the point where people described it as goo the word goo <laughs> comes up over and over and over again like it was more viscous somehow um which is a word that immediately turns almost every human being <laughs> off so after uh it actually stayed on the market for a very long time longer than you might expect i, I do remember seeing it around for a little while yeah that it, it seemed like it it maybe was going to be a thing because it was it was on the shelves for some time remind me what um what kind of time frame we're looking at for this Who has okay this? so uh, this one actually lasted much longer than some of our previous uh, contenders. This was on shelves for 12 years. They only stopped producing it on store shelves in 2012. And the truth is you can probably still find some of this stuff because ketchup has a long shelf life and stores aren't going to take it off the shelf if it's still you know within the sell-by date. Mm -hmm. So there's a very good chance you could still find a bottle of this stuff around. Um, their last dying gasp was that Burger King... Uh, did a tie-in with Heinz to create green ketchup that they gave away during St. Patrick's Day promotions. So if you really, really want this stuff, all you have to do is wait till St. Patrick's Day, roll up to a Burger King, and ask if they can give you some green ketchup. Participating locations only. Um. Sure, participating locations only. You can get you can pour green ketchup all over your chicken fries, and you know, and and laugh in the face of God. You can't. I suppose, you can't. <laughs> You can't put them. You can't put them on your satisfies fries, though. Um, no, that's no, not... <laughs> that's a that is a callback to a previous episode. Please listen to our satisfies fries uh, episode of worst business ideas in history. Yeah, this was. So, w what do we learn from the uh, Heinz Easy Squirt? Which, again, right off the top, there's a, there's a, a place I'd like to start. Usually, it's your it's your gig to point out what we learn. Oh, please, but please jump. You in. brought it up. You brought it up from the jump. It doesn't even, in the name, it doesn't even indicate what it is. It makes you think that it's a mechanical change, not an aesthetic one. Right. Yeah, easy easy squirt. Like, okay, the bottles are easy, but aren't all the other bottles are that kind of way as well. <laughs> I guess, I mean, to this one, it does feel like, you know, this was a somewhat valuable experience, uh, experiment for them because they were able to keep it on for a while, but uh, maybe just weren't getting what they needed you know, what they needed out of it long enough. Well, I think that one of the things is, um, this is a situation where they, they found a demographic that wanted this product and that, pro and that is kids and people and adults that have kids. Uh, what they didn't account for is whether people were going to want to buy more than one bottle, because I assume that at best people bought this product once 
uh, they ended up with three different colors of half finished ketchup bottles in their homes. And the parents said, never again. This is a red ketchup household. This is a red ketchup household. We don't truck with green ketchup in this house. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that's a really good point. There's always a novelty effect with something new introduced like this, right? So it's kind of like if you have something that you're bringing um, new to your clients, there likely will be a lot of, especially your existing clients, there will likely be a lot of people who will say, oh, I like what they've done in the past. Let me try this. And maybe you initially get some positive, you know, uh, response from that because, it's new and it's different and I like what they've done before. So we're going to try it out. Um, I, I think it also speaks to like knowing when to when trying to figure out when to cut it off. Right. Like, is, is this a thing? If this is a thing that is just doing okay, is it better for me to focus my attention on the things that are doing really well? Right. That as a small business owner, you're constantly having to make choices about where you're focusing your time. And something like this could be a, a distraction. Right. And in the early days, Keep was um, when Keep was founded, they were taking all sorts of random jobs that were unrelated, you know, kind of anything to keep the lights on, which, you know, if you're in a place, if you're in a place where you have to do that, there will be times when you have to do that. But. You know, I would strongly encourage you to work as hard as possible to get to being able to take the kinds of jobs that you want and not saying yes to every single option that you've got out there. And this was absolutely a distraction. You could tell that they, they, I think that it's more likely they took this product off of their, their um, catalog more because they were just like, it doesn't make enough money. Like it, it probably still made money towards the end, but it probably didn't make enough money to justify an entire product like plant full of people and the equipment that could just, they're like, you know what makes just as much money as purple ketchup, red ketchup. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there must've also been, you know, I'm thinking of the timeline from 2000 to about 2012 as people's ideas of what's healthy evolve and change. Um, you know, uh, food coloring and food additives like that haven't always had a good rap. So it seems like um, the fact that it had, you know, enough success to keep it moving that long at that time was, it was actually pretty surprising. Um, it, it seems like that probably just got the better of them. Yeah. And I think you, you really touched on to something there is, uh, you were talking about the changes in the way we perceive health and certainly the way people perceive what they feed their kids as whether it's healthy or not. And I think that there was a big shift, uh, post nineties, early two thousands, to kind of like stop putting artificial colors and ingredients in our children. Mm -hmm. like Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, this, this one I think is um, less of a big failure and more of like, you know, they did eventually move on. Um, it, it's kind of uh, one of these things like, well, it's just okay. And where should our focus be? And, you know, a giant corporation like Heinz can, probably afford to have some long-term stuff like that going on. Um, and it's good as a small business owner to have a long-term outlook, but focus I think is key. Narrowing down uh, what you're working on is absolutely key. All right. Um, I've been Derek Haru. This is Ducey Van Dusen. And we will talk to you guys next time. Bye. Keeping ever-expanding client info straight, sending the same emails hundreds of times, scheduling and rescheduling appointments over and over. Who enjoys this nonsense? No one, except my cousin Brent, and Brent is the absolute worst. Keep is the premier all-in-one CRM. Just head over to keep.com, that's K-E-A-P.com, and start your free trial today. Get the busy work out of the way so you can focus on what's important and make your small business grow with Keep. Start your free trial at keep.com. That's K-E-A-P dot com. More business, less work. That's Keep. All right, welcome back. Thank you for that, Ducey. Thank you, Derek. Um, all right, Grace. I wanted to I wanted to touch on something that you talked about earlier. You said that your weekend plans involved creating some course content. So help us understand: Has that always been a part of your model? Is that something that's new that you're doing as a reaction to the the quarantine? Uh, tell us a little more about that. So I have been working on online content for 
eight months. Um, but it was always a side project. And I was creating this big idea, like I'm going to make a whole postpartum program that is inclusive, validating, and body positive, which is something that's not currently on the market. I love that. Um, this has not yet been created, so hopefully <laughs> my idea. It will be by this weekend. <laughs> well, you got okay, this. so separate. <laughs> so I've been working on that one with co-partnering with a chiropractor, and that's going to be coming soon. However, in this past week, things have changed. I no longer can see patients with my hands, and I'm now learning a vulnerability in the career I have chosen is that my clients love my hands. So now that my hands are unavailable, there's a lot of like, well, we'll see you when this is over. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm like, "Um, honey, no. (laughs) So actually within a week's time, I got a download for new content. And right now I'm creating a program that has to do with our sense of safety and security. And that feeling actually resides in our pelvis in the deepest part of our pelvis. Mm. So right now, while we're all feeling like the floor may have been dropped out suddenly, I'm Mm -hmm. creating some program, an online program to help you navigate that some tools to use And where you might be feeling that in your body and how to integrate the feelings with your new reality. I was just going to say my hips have been getting even worse, like sitting like in a different environment than I'm used to at, you know, at work, we have like office chairs Mm -hmm. home. I'm just like sitting on the couch, but it's been definitely, I've noticed feelings in my body where it's like, I'm just feeling heavier. So Mm -hmm. I've been working out a little bit more and trying to make sure I'm moving, which has been helping. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably people are feeling that whether they're used to an office job or any kind of job right now, it's just shifted. Yeah. Shifting, transitioning, it can be for, it's, it has to do with our root, right? So the root is the part of us that feels like the gravity is coming down, but the earth is underneath us. So like, we're not going to fall that feeling. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have that really stable center, then shifting sand is like, whoa. (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind so of it's a good thing your wife is making you do yoga. Yeah. Oh boy, we don't want to talk about my hips. <laughs> it's probably good for you right now to be doing that yoga with her. When everyone sits cross-legged, it looks like I'm not sitting cross-legged. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, it, it. I was telling you, I have the same problem now, and I used to tease my dad about it, and now I'm like, man, he was hurting this much. I feel bad for teasing him. Uh, but yeah, so no, great, I definitely so think Grace, that's tell me a great course. Well, sorry, Crystal. That's okay. I just said it's a great course. So tell me when the first idea of that, is that, has that been something that's been on the back burner for a while and that you're just taking advantage of this opportunity? Did it, is it something that came, you know, in the moment after you found out about coronavirus? What was there? Maybe it's not related at all. Sounds like it is in some degree, but. It is related. It's, um, there's a healthy amount of anxiety that we all have. It's, it's that part of us that's like, oh, things are changing. How am I going to survive this? And so that's where that was born from. Great. <laughs> well, it's awesome because Clayt and I have been doing, uh, we, we did a series of webinars this past week. Mm-hmm. And it was all about the mindset strategies that entrepreneurs need to have in place to be successful. And so I just, I think this one, just your, your, responsiveness to the situation, your quick action around it. You know, you had to get to a place of decision and and into a place of action quickly. And it's just really inspiring to see that, you know, because oh, thank there you. yeah, there's there are obviously other options of, you know, like just sitting around and not, you know, sitting around in panic or in turmoil and not making not making those important decisions. But it's awesome to see that. Well, I had so a what? really good cry. Yeah. Well, good. I cried yeah, really fair. hard. I called a friend. I cried on the phone and I was like, this is the situation I'm in. And then as soon as I like let those feelings move, then I got a download of like, here's the new creative information oh, we need you to put. It. So instead of saying think, stuck, I kind of yeah. was able to. Love it. I think that's honestly the best thing you can do. Sometimes a good cry just helps you get over that part of it so that you can move on to actually being productive. Yes. So what would be some tips other than a good cry and moving on, uh, what would be some good tips you have for small businesses that are maybe experiencing some pain from their business shifting or loss of business? You know, what would you tell them to do right now? Oh, well, yeah. So I guess I would first say, um, to really, really 
look at what it is that they think they're facing. A lot of our fears, like, you know, 99% of our fears aren't actually happening. So what is it that you're really facing right now? What's the fear that's actually there? And then experience the feelings around that. And that might lead to a cry. And then I think after that, I would move into maybe a gratitude practice, like, okay, well, I have a roof over my head and just the list of things that right now in this moment, all of my needs are met Um, because we kind of go to catastrophizing quickly as small business owners, right? We're all like, it's over. (laughs) (laughs) It was all for nothing. (laughs) Uh, I guess when you put that much into something, it's easy to feel like that when things shift. Right. But it's just like you're married. You have an argument with your spouse. It's like you go through it. That doesn't mean everything's over. Right. Yeah. So it's like kind of coming into like the realities. of okay, okay. What's actually, what am I facing here? What do I still have going for me? Um, and then I would probably do something that would get me in a space of um, downloads. I call them downloads, but as an entrepreneur, when I'm feeling aligned and spiritual, I get these like crazy ideas that flow through me. And so for me, I would be doing something to get me in that space of the download. So it might be like seeing outside and looking to trees. It might be doing some yoga or some stretching or some deep breathing or some breath work or something like That's that. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I can hear in your voice, just the confidence that, you, you know, you know, there's a process to get there. You know, that maybe <laughs> in one moment you're not ready, uh-huh. but, um, but you know, you can get there. I think those are fantastic steps. And what is there? right I've had to face that a lot because every year I'm like I'm not making enough money but like I live in an apartment now so like it still feels like I need to be making more but I'm also spending more and to like bring that up like there's never enough it's that old scarcity crap yeah right (laughs) well and then there I was referring to was getting to that place of creation right because of the creation space yes yeah yeah, because okay. – uh, and, and obviously that's the key, I think, to getting – to in terms of getting the other benefits of that creation space. But, yeah. you know, as you called out, when, when your mind is gripped with fear, as many of us are, you know, having to deal with in different ways today, mm-hmm. um, yes. you're definitely not in that place, right? And so I, I love that you called out the need to just experience an emotion and allow it to pass through your body. And, you know, there's um, – I think there's a lot of resistance to the emotions that creates a lot of the suffering that we have. So I love that. If that yeah. needs to turn into a cry or whatever other yeah. form of, you know, experience that out. is. Yeah. Yeah. It may, it may be ugly on its way out. Yeah. And then I'll let you thought about Mine gratitude. is an ugly cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nothing a quarantini so, can't, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't, I try not to have a quarantini if I'm feeling low. That's I feel good. like that's actually, I was, yeah, I have healthy boundaries with my quarantines or any other kind of alcohol. But I do think that, um, really it just adds a little bit of fun. I've been by myself so, <laughs> so long at this point. I feel like maybe if I get a little quarantini in me, my like buzzed mood might be slightly different. And then it's like hanging out with someone else. <laughs> I mean, that's one way to look at it, but <laughs> who knows? It should be an interesting paint session if I'm slightly, uh, slightly on a quarantini, but we should be good. Um, so I was curious, Derek had mentioned something about you having to make a branding shift or a shift in some of your business strategies. I wanted to hear a little bit about that before we're forced, you know, they give us the red flag virtually this time, yeah. but I want to hear a little bit about that shift yeah. to make sure that um, we can kind of share that knowledge and anything you've learned from that. Sure. So I I would say I've done two shifts. The first one, I started a business. Um, it was a S Corp partnership with another physical therapist. And that was my first year into private practice and creating a company. <sighs> And it was <laughs> <laughs> so much work. It was such a high growth curve. Um, and uh, I was an unstable within myself. And I was just ending a long-term relationship. Sorry, there's a helicopter going over. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Oh, I was, yeah. I was like getting a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know if you, I'm like, I don't have a fancy microphone. You might hear that. Um, yeah. So that's was, okay. Thank you for telling me. I was getting scared, ready to hide under the table or okay. something. Yeah. Like, no, we're all good. I just live in LA. So it's just okay. Perfect. Normal sounds for me. Um, yeah. So I created this, this partnership 
Um, however, with my circumstance that was changing and then her circumstance, she was a new mom. So like the demands of motherhood were new for her to ex experience how much she can contribute. Ultimately, we couldn't make it work. It wasn't going to work. And so it needed to end. And I kept replaying the statistic in my head that like most businesses fail within the first year of, you know, and I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> it is scary. Right. Um, so the dissolving of that was hard to let it go and to move on. But also, you know, with a fresh start, you also get a new energy. So mm -hmm. when I was rebranding again, I was like, well, I don't have this cool idea. My first company was called Bloom Physical Therapy. And, and I was really jazzed about like the brand around it. And then when I had to rebrand suddenly, I was like, I asked one of my clients, I'm like, what are, what are your thoughts? And she was like, I don't care about the name. I only know your name. So then I was like, okay, the brand is me. And that was when I first drew that connection mm -hmm. that you can be so much of what your brand is. Like they can be so mirrored and the mirroring actually builds authenticity within the, re the receiving end of the client. Mm -hmm. So then my next brand was called Dr. Grace Physical Therapy. And I just went by my name. And then nice. just recently, as I have changed, so has my brand. <laughs> and now I am rooted Fair. physical therapy because I am all about rooting into this stability, safety, security space within us. And then COVID happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like rooted has roots. So you can keep that one long. Oh, it's going to be here. Yes. It's so brilliant. Yeah. I love it. Well, and it flows I naturally love that. with what you shared earlier too, you know, for what it's worth. Yeah, Thank you. totally. It and I feel right. like when all this is said and done, uh -huh. you'll still have rooted. Yes. And I think it still really identifies what your purpose and mission is. Thank you. And it's a great name. So I have faith that when this is all done, you're going to have some killer courses. Maybe even so before So another it's all way done. to serve. <laughs> yeah, you'll have those done before. But I'm yes. saying at the end of all this, yeah. you're going to have killer courses and a great business that's still going to be thriving. Yeah. So that's my prediction great. of after COVID because I don't see you slowing down. Yeah, you are like a ball of energy. I think it's going to just bounce right back. Yes. So it should be fine. Yes. Grace, I want to ask you the opposite question I asked earlier. I asked you sort of when was the moment of most doubt. Um, take us to the moment where you've been most fulfilled and excited about what your business is doing? You know, I get so many of those. So just the other day, I was um, working with a client, and um, she's two weeks postpartum, and she was feeling symptoms of maybe having a UTI, and I was like, she didn't want to go into urgent care because of everything that's going on. She needs to be staying at home. She's immunocompromised. And I was able to use my expertise to diagnose that it's actually a physical therapy issue that is presenting like an old feeling of a UTI and that it's very unlikely that she needs to go get a urinalysis. So, I mean, I, I like in just, in just what I'm providing, I'm creating so much of a change in each person I work with their life and they create an equal change in my life. So that connection and transference is validating every time it happens. And it happens to me every time I work with someone. Um, even, awesome. if, even if it's in a teaching way, even if it's in a way that's like, oh, this is the type of client or this client for whatever reason in this moment is actually not the right fit with me. Even that is teaching and validating in a way. So I, I get those highs, like those kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. I get those really, really often. And I, I don't take it for granted. I really do feel blessed. Well, it's very clear that you're helping all of your uh, patients and Thank all of your you. clients. Um, what would you, just as a final thought, what would you tell small businesses out there? You know, what would you tell them to keep going? How would you tell them to weather the storms that they face, you know, that you inevitably face every day in being a small business owner? Well, one thing that's coming up right away is research is me search. So anytime you're feeling that external business wanting to fix things outside, the job is to look inside on what's going on in here and work on that first. And then it will transfer out to outside. And um, for that, 
Um, I would say coming back, every yogi person says this, but I'm going to say it. (laughs) Coming back to breathing is a really good place to start anywhere with anything in this present moment, just taking a breath. So if you're feeling stuck and like you don't know what to do or if something unexpected has happened, just sitting still and taking some breaths and sitting with that feeling is actually, I would say, the most healthy advice I could give right now. I love that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Scott, do you have any other final thoughts? Well, I just, Grace, I want to thank you. I'm I'm just really impressed with the unique and obviously needed problem in the, in the world that you're solving. And it's just, you know, like I, I'm never, I never am ceased to be, let's see, how do you say that? It never ceases to amaze me. Mm-hmm. Um, at how the entrepreneurial spirit will go after and find these problems and then create unique solutions. And it's awesome. Not just, not even, not only are you creating solutions in your regular course of business, but you're adapting and learning and shifting um, like many of us are having to do in this environment. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just uh, super impressed with what you're doing and glad that you got to come on today and share some of your, uh, lessons and thoughts and ideas and recommendations for other business owners. I hope our listeners are able to find in your story, you know, a version of uh, their themselves and that they can yes. draw strength from that. Yes. We're all mirrors. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. Thanks guys. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to call that a wrap for this episode of small Woo-hoo. biz buzz. Thanks for listening to Small Biz Buzz. Please take a second to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star rating. It helps keep the show going. And if you need a hand with growing your small business, head over to keep.com. That's K-E-A-P.com and get started. More business, less work. That's Keep.